Greetings, and a loving hug from me to you, as I welcome you back to this online conference, The Bible from a Medical Perspective and Medicine from a Biblical Perspective. I bless you on this day with Abba Father's shalom peace, his joy unspeakable, his faith unstoppable, his agape love and his richest blessings in every dimension of your life. This message is a follow-on from session 10, part one of the online conference, where I explained in detail about the seven biblical feasts. This is essential background foundational knowledge to gain the full understanding of what I am going to share in this session. So if you haven't seen it already, before watching this session, I strongly recommend that you watch session 10 part one first, which is titled God's Genius Lifestyle Roadmap in the Seven Biblical Feasts. The various parts of session 10 is a series of messages on the end times described in the book of Revelations to help us understand what is currently unfolding on the world stage. And it will crack open the meaning and revelation of much of the book of revelations that you may not have understood as in depth before. It is very interesting, spiritually enriching, and helps us to prepare for the time ahead. However, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to watch session 10 part one on the biblical feasts first before watching this message or any of the other parts to follow in session 10 
because you just won't be able to fully understand a lot of the important key concepts that I'm going to explain in this teaching without that essential foundational background of the biblical feasts. And then three other sessions of the online conference that would also be very good to revise in order to gain the maximum benefit from this series of messages in session 10 is session six, part one, where I explain sanctification of the spirit, soul, and body. Session seven, part two, where I explain the significance of the menorah in the tabernacle to the bride of Christ. And session eight, part six, where I explain the significance of white linen garments to the end time bride. In the last session, we saw that the first four of the seven biblical feasts is prophetically symbolic of Jesus's first coming and all that was accomplished for us when he died on the cross. He was crucified on Passover. He was buried during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he rose on the Feast of First Fruits, fulfilling all that these biblical feasts represent. The Feast of Pentecost to Shavuot is a celebration of receiving the Word of God and the Holy Spirit where Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai on this day, and then 3,000 years later to the very day, the Holy Spirit descended in tongues of fire on the disciples in Acts chapter 2. And then we saw how Abba Father has revealed his plan for us in the end times through the prophetic significance and meaning of the three biblical feasts at the end of the year. We're at a specific point in the end times on the Feast of Trumpets. Jesus will come and fetch his bride in what is commonly called the rapture to take her for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Whilst the bride is at the wedding feast, God's judgment will hit the earth on the Day of Atonement, which is the biblical feast of Yom Kippur, and the full extent of the Great Tribulation will take place, which culminates at the Battle of Armageddon, when Jesus will return with heaven's armies, with his worshipping warrior bride riding alongside with him, to defeat the Antichrist and remove Satan and sin from the earth, which is the ultimate fulfillment of all that the Day of Atonement represents. Following that, Jesus will establish his kingdom on earth, where he will rule and reign with his bride, and he will tabernacle or live amongst us for a thousand years, which is known as the millennium rest, which is what the Feast of Tabernacles represents. And so through the biblical feasts, our Father has revealed to us his plan for the end times. In the last session, I also explained how the spiritual principles that are represented in the seven biblical feasts is designed by Abba Father to lead his people into a lifestyle pattern that equips his bride to be prepared and ready when Jesus comes to fetch her for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And remember that the shofar in the Feast of Trumpets is the sound of an alarm to wake up God's people in spiritual slumber who are in a lifestyle of fleshliness, worldliness, lukewarmness and compromise to get ready and prepared for the coming of the King through repentance and sanctification of the Word of God. Something else very important that I explained in session 10 part 1 is that not all born-again Christians will be taken up in the rapture because, sadly, not all born-again Christians will be ready. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45 explains that just as there was a first Adam in the Garden of Eden, Jesus is the last Adam. And just as the first Eve was, at, was Adam's wife, so the bride of Christ is the last Eve. 
And just as Eve came out from Adam's rib, so the bride will come out of the body of Christ or the church. In other words, in the end times in which we find ourselves, the Christian church and the bride of Christ is not necessarily the same thing. This is important to understand because many Christians have been taught a false security whereby they have been led to believe that just because they pray, prayed the prayer of salvation and become born again children of God, they don't have to be concerned about or pay attention to anything related to the end times because it's not relevant to them, because the church will be raptured before any of it takes place. And in the meantime, they think they can continue living as they please in a fleshly lifestyle of compromise that's no different from the rest of the world. But remember, Jesus warned in Revelations 3 verse 16, So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Christians that are not ready on the Feast of Trumpets, on the year that this feast is fulfilled, where Jesus comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb, will be left behind to go through the full extent of the great tribulation described in the book of Revelations as a final act of God's mercy, because it will be a time where the circumstances are so extreme that you can't stay lukewarm. Either your heart will grow cold as you become a part of the great falling away that scripture prophesied about, or you will repent and your heart will become hot for God as you walk through the refiner's fire of the tribulation. But it is better to allow Abba Father to judge us now and to repent now than to have to go through the full extent of the great tribulation to get to that place of sanctification. Scripture says that the great tribulation will be a time more terrible than any other time ever recorded in history. It will make Hitler and his concentration camps look like child's play in comparison. Matthew 24 verse 21 says, For at that time there will be a great tribulation, pressure, distress and oppression, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be again. And that is why Jesus said in Luke 21 verse 36, Watch! which means stay spiritually awake and pray that you will be counted worthy to escape the things to come. We don't want to be here on this earth during the great tribulation and when God's judgment hits the earth on the day of atonement. When the last three biblical feasts are fulfilled, we want to be a part of the bride that is raptured at the Feast of Trumpets and that joins Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelations 19, verse 7 to 9, it says, Let us rejoice and shout for joy. Let us give him glory and honor, for the marriage of the Lamb has come at last, and his bride, the redeemed, has prepared herself. She has been permitted to dress in fine linen, dazzling white and clean, for the fine linen signifies the righteous acts of the saints and the godly character of believers. And then the angel said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's important to understand all of these things, not to bring fear, because remember, fear is not of Abba Father. It's a warning to tell us to get ready. So the purpose of this session is to bring an understanding about what it practically means to be ready when Jesus comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The parable of the ten virgins that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25 shows us that not all Christians will be ready when Jesus comes to fetch his bride and therefore will not be able to take part in the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
This parable also has some important keys that helps us to understand what it means to be ready for the return of our bridegroom and king. So let's read it together in Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13. Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going to go out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. To fully understand this parable, you need to understand the Hebrew customs of marriage, which were explained in detail at the beginning of session 10, part 1 on the biblical feasts. In this parable, there were 10 virgins that is symbolic of the body of Christ or believers in the church who are born again. But not all of them were able to take part in the wedding feast because not all of them were ready. Remember that one of the Hebrew customs of marriage was that whilst the bride-to-be was waiting for her bridegroom, during the engagement period, she would keep a lamplet on her windowsill as a sign to her bridegroom that she is ready and waiting for him. So the first thing that the bridegroom would look for when he came to fetch his bride for the wedding feast was the lamp on her windowsill to see if it was lit. Because if it was not lit, it meant that she was not ready or perhaps had lost interest and no longer wanted to marry him. Because the bride didn't know exactly the day or the hour, of when the bridegroom was coming to get her, she had to make sure that her lamp was burning at all times. And to keep her lamp lit, the bride had to make sure that she had enough oil. Now let's go deeper to understand what Jesus is teaching us in the scripture concerning the spiritual principles that it represents and how the parable of the ten virgins parallels to our life in terms of how this shows us what it means to be ready. What does this parable mean concerning having enough oil? What is the extra oil? And how can we ensure that we have extra oil so that we are found ready when the bridegroom returns? To understand the answer to this question, we need to understand sanctification of the spirit, soul, and body. In session six, part one of this online conference, I shared about the importance of sanctification of our spirit, soul, and body, and how healing takes place as a result of this. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 says, and may the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray to God that your whole spirit, soul, and body would be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whilst healing is a side benefit of sanctification, the ultimate purpose is to mold us into his image and prepare us as his bride so that we will be ready, as this scripture says, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 
is an example of a scripture that shows us that we are made up of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. In session 10, part two, I explained how the way that God designed the tabernacle is a blueprint for how he designed the human body. To understand this, imagine a picture of us being like a house that consists of three rooms. We see this represented in the tabernacle, where there's the outer court which correlates with our body, the inner court which correlates with our soul, and the Holy of Holies, which correlates with our spirit. Now, before we are born again, our spirits are cut off from God and we are in a dead, dark place that looks a bit like the picture on the screen. But when we accept Jesus as our Savior through what he did on the cross, our spirit is reunited with God and in that moment it becomes alive again. And at this time, God deposits everything of himself into our spirit, all the beauty of his nature, his love and who he is, and everything that we need for life and godliness, as it says in 2 Peter 1 verse 3. So our spirits are now complete, beautiful and perfect. And you could imagine our spirit looking like a room in the house that looks like the picture on the screen, that is like a beautiful golden white palace. But then Philippians 2 verse 12 says, work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling. What does Philippians 2 verse 12 mean when it says we must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling? Was the salvation that Jesus provided for us on the cross not complete? Yes, of course it was. But what we need to understand is that after becoming born again, our souls remain unchanged. Remember, our soul is our mind, will and emotions. In other words, we still have our old poisonous thinking patterns of, for example, fear, anxiety, worry, guilt, shame, rejection, unworthiness, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, and all of these things in our soul. So our soul still looks like a building that's in ruins, like in the picture on the screen, even though our spirit looks like a beautiful palace at the time that we become born again. And because our soul is in a mess, so is our body. Because we've learnt in previous teachings how our thoughts and emotions affect the health of our bodies. Therefore, our soul still needs to go through a process of change after we become born again. James 1 verse 21 says, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. This scripture says that the word of God is able to save our souls. In other words, this scripture explains the work of sanctification that needs to continue from our spirit into our souls after salvation. In other words, our soul, which is our mind, will and emotions, is saved through the renewing of our minds with God's word where we get rid of all our old poisonous mindsets that come from the image of the serpent and learn to think like God thinks, to think, feel, speak and act according to his image. This is what it means to work out our own salvation in Philippians 2 verse 12. It is the renewing of our mind with God's word which sanctifies or saves our soul. In Ezekiel 16 verse 8 to 9, Jesus spoke about washing his bride with water, which represents his word, and he spoke about covering up her nakedness by dressing her in clean white linen garments. This was also alluded to in Revelations 3 verse 18, which says, 
I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and have white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And then in Ephesians 5 verse 25 to 26 we read, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such things. In all of these scriptures that I've just read out, it speaks about the bride being washed in the water of the word so that she is wearing clean white garments without spots or wrinkles. What does it mean to have spots on our garments? Imagine a wedding dress in the natural with black ink spots and dirt all over it. It wouldn't look very good, would it? Those black ink spots are our old mindsets that come from the kingdom of darkness. For example, the fear, anxiety, guilt, shame, rejection, unworthiness, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, strife, and so on. And there is only one thing that is able to wash out these stains and black ink spots in our wedding garments spiritually, and that is the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is practically applied to our lives when we repent. In other words, the blood of Jesus is like soap and his word is like the water that cleanses our wedding garments so that we are brought to the place of wearing pure white wedding garments spiritually. So to be practical, for example, if you have bitterness and unforgiveness and a wound of hurt that you are carrying in your soul towards somebody who mistreated you in the past, that bitterness that you are carrying from the kingdom of darkness would be like a black ink spot on your wedding garment spiritually. So as you repent of that bitterness in your heart before Abba Father, it's like applying the blood of Jesus, which is the soap on that black spot. And then as you renew your mind with the word of God in this area, which is to change your thinking to forgiveness, that is like the water which washes off the black ink spot of bitterness from your wedding garment as your soul is sanctified and cleansed in that area. And then there may be another black ink spot or mindset from the kingdom of darkness of, for example, fear anxiety and worry. So as the Holy Spirit reveals this to you, you apply the soap of the blood of Jesus to that black ink spot of fear by repenting of it with all your heart before Abba Father. And then you apply the water of the word, where you spend time renewing your mind with the word of God in this area, with scriptures that teach us how to overcome fear and anxiety until you no longer think that way and your mind is renewed where you've learned to walk according to the Father's image in this area with peace, joy and love. Then there may, for example, be another blacking spot of unworthiness, a low self-esteem, a poor self-image and a wound of rejection in your soul which is like another blacking spot from the kingdom of darkness on your wedding garment spiritually. And so as the Holy Spirit brings this to your attention, you apply the soap on that black spot, which is the blood of Jesus, as you repent for this mindset that is not of God, and you wash it with the water of the word as you renew your mind by studying scriptures that teach you how to build a strong, solid, healthy, godly identity based on who you are in Christ. And so sanctification of our souls, which is our mind, will and emotions, is a progressive journey where we get rid of those old filthy mindsets from the kingdom of darkness and progressively remove one black ink spot 
on our wedding garment at a time. As we deal with one area of our soul at a time, and this is the cleansing and sanctification of our soul, as we apply the blood of Jesus through repentance, and we apply the water of the word through renewing our minds. This is what prepares our wedding garments so that we can be clothed in pure white, ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is what Ephesians 5 verse 25 to 26 means when it says Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such things. Way back in the Garden of Eden before the fall, Adam and Eve's spirit and soul was one, and they lived in the spiritual realm and the natural realm at the same time. But after the fall, there was a split or separation between our spirit and soul. And this is represented by the veil separating the Holy of Holies from the inner court and the tabernacle. When Jesus died on the cross, this veil was torn in two, and John 10 verse 9 says that he became the door, the way, the truth, and the life. When the Passover meal was first instituted, the Israelites had to apply blood to their doors so that death would pass over them and they would not be affected by the plague coming upon the Egyptians that would kill their firstborn sons. This was a picture that was a foreshadow of what we now need to do in our lives spiritually. We're in the same way. We need to apply the blood of Jesus to the door of our soul through repentance and renewal of our minds. So that our soul is transformed and becomes a beautiful white palace like our spirit and so that our soul becomes one with our spirit again. When our soul has been sanctified from poisonous disease-making mindsets of the serpent, through applying his blood through repentance, and through the washing of the water of the word and renewal of the mind, and we have developed godly mindsets fashioned after the image of God, our body naturally comes into alignment with our soul and spirit. Because remember, the health and condition of our body is determined by the condition of our soul. In session one of the online conference, I went into a lot of detail on how the brain works. And I shared how the majority of diseases are caused by long-term poisonous thinking patterns in our soul. And so when the wounds in our soul of unmet needs, unhealed hurts and unresolved issues that lead to and open the door to poisonous disease making mindsets are dealt with through the blood of the lamb and repentance and renewing the mind with the word of God. Through the mind body connection, the body will be healed of diseases and all that is in the body that is not of God. And that is sanctification of the body, which is removal of disease and everything that destroys it. And that is the full outworking of our salvation and all the redemption and restoration that Jesus provided for us on the cross. This is where the work of sanctification in our spirit is continued through into our soul and then into our body, as his blood washes our souls of sin as we repent, and by his stripes our bodies are healed and made whole. So now all three rooms of our spirit, soul, and body has been transformed, purified, and sanctified like a beautiful white palace so that as 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 says, 
our spirit, soul, and body is sanctified and ready for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. After the fall of Adam and Eve, we have lived with our spirit and soul being dominated by our flesh. But now, as we have gone through the sanctification process, things are now back in the correct order, whereby our sanctified body becomes one with our sanctified soul, that becomes one with our sanctified spirit, where our spirit now rules over our soul and body, and that is what it practically means to live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. At the rapture, Jesus will come to fetch his bride, and scripture says that in the twinkling of an eye, we will be snatched up to heaven. But that will be the final manifestation of the rapture. But it is already happening in the bride right now, in the sense that as her body becomes one with her soul, which becomes one with her spirit, she's now living a higher life according to the spirit, where her spirit is now ruling over her soul and body. And as the bride is living this higher life, she is already rising into a higher dimension, ready for the bridal harvest at the final manifestation of the rapture. So in summary, Philippians 2 verse 12 says, work out, cultivate, carry out the goal and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling. When we are born again, as we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our spirit becomes alive as it is reunited with God, as we are restored in relationship with him, and he deposits everything of himself into our spirit. But then we need to work out our salvation, where that work in our spirit needs to be carried through into our soul and continued in our soul. Because at the time that we are born again, our souls are still unchanged and our souls still have wounds of unmet needs, unhealed hurts and unresolved issues, which has opened the door to poisonous mindsets that come from the image of the serpent, like the fear, guilt, shame, anger, bitterness and so on, that leads us into bondage in various different ways. And so like the Israelites put blood on the doors of their homes at Passover, spiritually, we need to apply his blood to the door of our soul through repentance so that the redemptive work of the cross can continue into our soul or pass over into our soul so that our soul can be changed and transformed back into his image as we renew our minds with the word of God. This is what James 1 verse 21 practically means when it says, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And again, as our soul is healed, restored and made whole through the sanctification process, through the mind-body connection, our body will be healed, restored, and made whole as well. With that important foundational understanding in place, we are now ready to bring out the revelation of what it practically means to be ready as the bride. And it is all related to this point that we need to work out our salvation where that work in our spirit needs to be carried through into our soul and continued in our soul. And we saw how sanctification of our soul is accomplished through repentance, where we apply the blood of the lamb, which is like soap, and renew our mind, which is the washing of the water of the word that cleanses the black ink spots of the mindsets of the kingdom of darkness 
from our wedding garments so that we are brought to the place of wearing pure white wedding garments spiritually and are found ready when Jesus returns. Now you will understand the answer to the questions that I brought up in the beginning about the meaning of the parable of the ten virgins. What does it mean to have enough oil? What is the extra oil? How can we ensure that we have extra oil so that we are found ready when the bridegroom returns? The extra oil referred to in the parable of the ten virgins is the sanctification of our souls. Through applying the blood of Jesus through repentance and renewing our minds with the word of God. Let's read the parable of the ten virgins again with this deeper level of understanding. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. So in this parable, the ten virgins represents all believers in the body of Christ. All of them were born again, and so all of them had some oil, which is the oil in the vessel of their spirit, so to speak. But only the wise virgins had extra oil in the extra vessel of their soul, where their soul had been sanctified with the blood of the Lamb through repentance and the washing of the water of the word, which is renewing the mind. In other words, the wise virgins allowed the work of the cross and the redemption and restoration that Jesus provided on the cross to continue from their spirit into their soul or to pass over into their soul as they applied Jesus's blood to the doors of their soul. In practical terms, these wise virgins had continued with the process of sanctification after salvation, where they spent time in God's presence, seeking him and getting to know him as they grew in their intimate love relationship with him. And as they spent time in his presence, he began to shine his light on their hearts so that they could see the condition of their soul and they could see all the unmet needs, unhealed hurts and unresolved issues and all the wounds in their soul that had opened the door for the mindsets of the kingdom of darkness that had kept their soul in darkness and bondage. And the wise virgins responded to this by repenting and being washed by the blood of the Lamb and renewing their mind with the word of God that saved their souls. So now their souls were also filled with oil, which is the extra oil that the parable of the ten virgins is referring to. The foolish virgins did not go through the sanctification process of their soul after salvation. They may have gone to church on a Sunday and been part of ministry activities and called themselves Christians and socialized in Christian circles. And although they had heard a lot about him, they didn't really get to intimately know him. Because if you really know him, you will go through the process of change as a result of knowing him. But the foolish virgins hardly ever spent time in God's presence or invested the time to renew their minds with his word. And they were enjoying their fleshly, soulish life of worldliness so much that they were not willing to lay it down. And so their souls remained unchanged, with the same ways of thinking, speaking, acting, and living, like those in the world who don't know Abba Father. For example, they stayed with lots of wounds in their soul of anger and resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness and strife and grumbling and complaining and gossiping and judging and criticizing, 
continuing in the same mindsets and habits of thinking of guilt and shame and rejection and unworthiness and fear and anxiety and worry and envy and jealousy and addictions and fleshliness and worldliness and lukewarmness and compromise and pride etc and all the ways of the world that are according to the image of the serpent and these things were never dealt with through repentance and renewing the mind the foolish virgins had some oil in their spirit because they were born again and had prayed the prayer of salvation but because the soul of the foolish virgins remained in its unchanged condition they did not have the extra oil in the extra vessel of their soul and so it was like their spirit was filled with hot water and their soul is filled with cold water which when mixed together made them lukewarm jesus said again in revelations 3 verse 16 but since you are like lukewarm water neither hot nor cold i will spit you out of my mouth and now hopefully you can understand the reality of what that practically means because the foolish virgins were lukewarm where the condition of their soul remained unchanged they were not ready when the bridegroom came to fetch them for the wedding feast it's like somebody bursting into the room and saying hey let's go and then suddenly realizing that you're not dressed yet and you're naked it's like being caught with your pants down that's why revelations 3 verse 18 says i counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and be found with white garments so that you can clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen let's come back to the parable of the ten virgins and carry on where we left off the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom five of them were foolish and five of them were wise for when the foolish took their lamps they took no oil with them but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps and as the bridegroom was delayed they all became drowsy and slept but at midnight there was a cry here is the bridegroom come out to meet him then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said to the wise give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out but the wise answered saying since there won't be enough for us and for you go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves what this is saying here is that nobody else can do our personal preparation for us we have to repent for ourselves and renew our mind for ourselves somebody else can't sanctify our souls for us and repent for us and renew our mind for us we have to purchase the extra oil for our own soul for ourselves. continuing with the scripture and while they were going to buy the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut afterwards the other virgins came also saying lord lord open to us but he answered Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Again, in the parable of the ten virgins, all of them are born again. And all of them wake up to the truth of God's word. But not all of them do it in terms of actually living it. We see that the ten virgins are divided into two groups of five. This takes us back to the story of the two mountains of the blessings and curses in Deuteronomy chapter 11. In verse 29 it says, When Yahweh your God has brought you into the land you are entering to possess, you are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim the blessings on an, and on Mount Ebal, the curses. I was blessed to be able to personally visit and stand on these two mountains when I went to Israel. 
And what was particularly fascinating for me to see is how these two mountains are right next to each other. And on Mount Gerizim, where the blessings were proclaimed, that come from obedience and doing the word of God, green vegetation grows. Like a physical picture of his blessing that comes in every dimension, even in creation, when his people hear and do the word of God. On Mount Ebal, where the curses were proclaimed, it is totally desolate. Nothing grows there. It's just rocks and dirt. A physical picture of the barrenness and curses that come in every dimension of life, even affecting creation because of God's people being disobedient to the word. In Deuteronomy 27 verse 12, half the tribes of Israel proclaimed the blessings on Mount Gerizim and on Mount Ebal, the other half of the tribes of God's people proclaimed the curses. Abba Father got his people to do this physical exercise on these two mountains to give us a picture of a very important concept of understanding. There is a connection between these two mountains and the parable of the ten virgins, representing those who live a lifestyle of Shema, in other words, those who obey and those who don't. In Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, Yahweh said to his people, So now I give you the choice between life and death, the blessings and the curses. You choose and decide on which mountain you will stand. The valley between these two mountains is most likely the Valley of Decision, also known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat, described in Joel chapter 3. In the Valley of Decision is where God's people choose between these two mountains. Are you going to go this way or this way? Choosing the blessings through obedience or the curses that come from disobedience. Joel 3 verse 14 says, Multitudes, multitudes are in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision when judgment is executed. When you read the context of this verse in the whole of Joel chapter 3, it shows how those in this valley ended up still being there. They got there by not making the decision while they were in the valley of decision, and so they stayed in the valley. And Joel chapter 2 and 3 is describing how the time for decision or the opportunity to make a decision is over by then. And God's judgment is falling when the time of the great tribulation begins just after the rapture of the bride. So in other words, by staying in the valley of decision and not choosing, you are choosing. I hope that makes sense. This is a picture of lukewarmness. When you have one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world. And when you are lukewarm, you are setting yourself up to fall under judgment. Like the foolish virgins who were not ready when Jesus came to fetch his bride and were left behind to go through the judgment of the great tribulation. Let's have a look at how the wise virgins are those of God's people who live a Shema lifestyle of listening to and obeying the word of God. James 1 verse 22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. In James 1 verse 22 we see the importance of both listening to and doing the commandments of God's word. This is what the Hebrew word Shema means, a daily lifestyle of listening to and obeying him. One of the key trademarks of the true bride of Yahweh is her Shema lifestyle. 
Yeshua, our bridegroom, said that we love him by obeying his commandments. For example, in John 14, verse 15 to 16, he said, If you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. Walking in obedience means walking in love. And walking in love means walking in obedience. Love is the departure point for obedience. Obedience flows out of love. Many times in this conference, I've shared about how when somebody asked Jesus in Mark 12, verse 28 to 29, what the greatest commandment was, he answered by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 to 9, where he said in Hebrew, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohinu, Adonai Echad, which means Shema, hear and obey my word, my people, for the Lord your God is one. And then he added to that by saying, and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So in essence, Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to Shema, to listen to and obey his word as an overflow of a love relationship with him. You may have heard of the importance of what is called the order of Melchizedek. For example, Psalm 110 verse 4 and Hebrews 7 verse 17 says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What is that talking about? Well, Mel Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which later became Jerusalem. In other words, Jerusalem. We see Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek in scripture. Now, what was significant about Melchizedek is that he was not only a king, but also a priest. He was a foreshadow and type of Jesus, who is our high priest and king of righteousness, who will rule and reign in the new Jerusalem, in the new millennium and in eternity. Both the kingdom and the priesthood of Jesus, which is basically what the order of Melchizedek is, needs to be applied to our lives. We cannot have one without the other. The priesthood represents our inner life, our intimacy and fellowship with him in his presence, and time spent in renewing our minds with his word so that his word is stored up in our hearts. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 33, we see how he desires to write his word and his commandments on our hearts. This is the listening part, to listen to God's word. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 33 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and on their hearts will I write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. So the priesthood is about the transformation of our inner life, with the word of God as it is written on our hearts and stored up like a treasure in our hearts. And then James 1 verse 22 said, we must not only listen to God's word, but do it. And that is the kingdom, which represents the transformation of our outer life with the word of God. So in summary, the order of Melchizedek is the priesthood, which is our inner life of listening to God's word and writing it on our hearts. And the kingdom, which is our outer life 
of doing God's word. And once again, you can't have one without the other. If you just apply the kingdom without the priesthood, where you try to apply God's word and his kingdom principles to your daily life without spending time with him, you are in performance and you are trying to do it in your own strength. And this is merely religious dead works. But if you just apply the priesthood where you study God's word, but you never apply his principles to your life and actually do his word, well, that doesn't work either because scripture says that faith without works is dead. So we need to listen to and do the commandments of God's word, which is what the Hebrew word Shema means. Now let's explore the significance of this more in scripture and see the truth and reality of it even in science. As the intelligent designer and author of all of creation, our Father is an incredibly detailed God, and he does not do anything by accident. Everything in his word has meaning, even colors. So let's go into the world of physics to bring out some amazing revelation of the spiritual significance of colors in scripture and how it relates to the Shema lifestyle of the Bride of Yahweh. When you pass a beam of white light through a prism, as shown on the screen, it splits into the seven colors of the rainbow, of which white light is composed of. In creation, we have the pleasure of enjoying the beauty of different colors, and this is how it works. The sun gives off white light, which is a mixture of all seven colors of the rainbow. When that white light hits an object, some colors are absorbed by the object and other colors are reflected outwardly. The color reflected outwardly is the color that we then see or perceive that object as with our eyes. For example, in the picture on the screen in the bottom right corner, the red surface appears red because all the other six colors of the rainbow are absorbed by that surface, whilst the color red is reflected outwardly, so we see that surface with our eyes as red. In session eight, part two of this online conference, I spoke in detail about the medical and spiritual significance of the prayer shawl to the bride. And I focused a lot on the blue twisted string of the tzitzit in the corner of the prayer shawl in terms of how it relates to our DNA. This tzitzit was described in Numbers chapter 15, where the blue strand and the twisted string served as a reminder to God's people to keep his commandments and to do them. Numbers 15 verse 38 to 39 says, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout all their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, to not follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. I just read the scripture to you now to show that symbolically blue is associated with remembering and doing the word of God. In the order of Melchizedek, this is the kingdom part to apply God's word to our outer daily life. In scripture, gold is associated with loving God's commandments and storing them up like a treasure in our heart. For example, Psalm 119 verse 72 says, The law from your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. In Psalm 119 verse 127 it says, Therefore I love your commandments more than resplendent gold, yes, more than perfectly refined gold. Remember earlier, we read in Revelations 3 verse 18, 
that we are counseled to buy gold from Yahweh that is being refined in the fire. We have to buy this gold, which means that we need to pay a price for this gold. Because, for example, this involves dying to self and crucifying the flesh and the sin nature in us and paying the price in, for example, sacrificing the time and investing the personal effort to renew our minds with his word and to store up his word inside of us. Now, with that in the back of our minds, let's have a look at Revelations 21, verse 21. It says, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each separate gate being built of one solid pearl. And the main street, the broad way of the city, was of gold, as pure and translucent as glass. Here in Revelations 21, it is describing the New Jerusalem, where we will live for all eternity. And in verse 21, it says that we will walk on streets of gold. Now, when scripture talks about streets of gold, is this only in the literal sense or is there a deeper meaning? What would be the significance of walking on streets of gold? This is where it starts to get interesting. Let's go back to physics. Gold, or the color yellow, is often referred to as negative blue light. This means that gold reflects all colors, with the exception of blue, whereby it absorbs or retains all blue wavelengths. In essence, gold keeps all blue inside of itself. Now let's apply what physics and science knows along with the symbolism of these colors in scripture. Blue stands for the remembering or doing of God's word. The significance of the fact that gold retains all blue inside of itself symbolizes retaining the blue or God's word inside our hearts to make gold. Gold retains all blue inside of itself, which is symbolic of us retaining God's word inside our hearts. It is the writing of God's word on our hearts, where our hearts have been transformed through the renewing of our mind with the word of God. And renewing our mind with the word of God transforms us into his image, which is also what gold spiritually represents, the image of God. And that brings us back to the golden menorah, which remember is symbolic of the bride walking in God's image. The remembrance of God's word, the blue, through studying and renewing our minds with it, is how we become like gold refined in the fire. We need to study his word and learn and remember his commandments and kingdom principles by heart, which is how we write them on our hearts. And this is the gold retaining the blue inside itself. So in summary, gold keeps all blue inside itself. Simply put, gold means having God's word on the inside of us. So when scripture associates gold with the commandments and instructions of God's word, this should make much more sense. Not only is gold rare, beautiful and precious, just like God's commandments and instructions of his word should be treasured by us, but it also retains all the wavelengths of blue which is God's commandments to do them. When Revelations 3 verse 18 says, to buy gold refined in the fire from Yahweh, that means we are to buy his commandments by storing his word inside our hearts and allowing it to transform our hearts 
and our entire being into his image, the golden menorah. When you put the seven colors of the rainbow on the menorah, which you can do to see the picture of all the patterns of seven in scripture, you can see the connection between blue and yellow, where they are connected by the same branches of the menorah. And you can even see this connection in physical science where gold is negative blue light, in other words, gold retaining blue, and in the same way, blue retains gold. Blue absorbs gold or yellow wavelengths and reflects blue light. This is how we perceive an object as blue with our eyes. This symbolizes the fact that once we have God's law written on our heart, we are empowered to do it and to live it in our daily life. Remember, blue is to obey and do the word of God. Yellow and gold is to hear the word of God, and blue is to do the word of God. And remember, to hear and obey is the Hebrew word Shema. It is important to become like gold, meaning to put the word of God inside of our hearts through studying it and renewing our minds with it. And this is where the word of God transforms us inwardly into gold, which is the priesthood, which relates to our inner life. And likewise, it's also important to be like blue, where we reflect the same word of God outwardly to others by doing the word of God in our daily lives, which is the kingdom. So both colors, both gold and blue, plays a critical symbolic role in helping us understand the purpose of God's word and how it equips us to be prepared as his bride. Now, if gold is retaining the word of God on the inside of us and blue is doing the word of God outwardly, guess what happens when you mix both yellow and blue light frequencies together? When you combine gold light with blue light, they become a perfect, brilliant white light. In other words, we become clothed in the white garments of the bride spoken about in Revelation 3 verse 18 and many other places in scripture. In other words, his bride is the one who Shema, hears and obeys, listens to and does his word. And now you know why white light is used so often in the Bible to illustrate our wedding garments and why the bride is described as wearing white linen garments, which is a material that reflects white light. This is why in the context of telling us to buy gold from Yahweh that is refined in the fire, he makes mention of clothing ourselves in white garments. To read it again, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you can be rich and be wearing white garments so that you can clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. The white garments from a physics perspective is both gold and blue mixed together, which represents both listening to and obeying or hearing and doing God's word. That is why James said what he said in James 1 verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. If we truly have the word of God on the inside of us inwardly as gold, then we would naturally want to do the word of God as blue, making us become clothed in white, ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb when Jesus returns. This is how we practically prepare ourselves to be his bride. When Revelations 21 verse 21 says that we will walk on streets of gold for all eternity in the new Jerusalem, that symbolically means that our hearts are permanently transformed to only have the word of God on the inside of us and no longer the law of sin or the flesh nature. 
The streets of gold is symbolically the streets of God's word. Just as we walk on streets physically, the streets of gold represents walking in his ways. The streets of gold represents a lifestyle of Shema, listening to and obeying his word. Through everything that I've shared in this message, I wanted to bring out the revelation to you that as you continue your journey of healing, where we are going through the different spiritual strongholds and poisonous disease-making mindsets and dealing with and overcoming them through repentance and renewing of the mind, as each of the sessions of this online conference are guiding and leading us to do, Realize that this is not just for our healing and so that we can enjoy divine health, but more importantly, through learning this lifestyle of Shema, hearing and obeying his word, it is equipping you to prepare yourself as the bride for the very soon coming of our Messiah, King and Bridegroom.
of the ten virgins ended off where the foolish virgins who were not found ready when Jesus returned to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb found themselves behind a closed door where it says the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Afterward the other foolish virgins came also saying Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 16 to 18 explains that when we renew our minds with the word of God, from glory to glory, in other words, step by step, little by little, it progressively transforms us into his image, where one area of our character at a time becomes more and more like his character, and we walk more and more in his image, where we look like him in the way that we think, the way that we speak, the way that we act and, and respond to people and circumstances, and we look like him in the way that we live our lives. For example, we have peace, joy, love, kindness, goodness, patience, gentleness, self-control, forgiveness, mercy, and everything that God is has become a part of who we are through the process of sanctification of our soul, where we have gone through repentance and renewing our mind. For this reason, the bride who has purchased the extra oil will be found walking in the image of Yahweh when Jesus comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
his image in her, he will recognize and he will say, I know you. I feel like I need to repeat that very important statement again. His image in her, he will recognize and he will say, I know you. But the sobering reality is that many will come to him in the end times who are like the foolish virgins whose souls remained unchanged and who are thinking, speaking and living no different than the rest of the world that walks according to the image of the serpent. And he will say to them, who are you? And they will say, Lord, I went to church. I am a Christian. I even did a lot for you. I even preached the Bible to others and did many miracles in your name. And he will say, I don't know you. Depart from me. These are born again Christians who never took the time to renew their minds with the word of God and therefore did not go through the process of sanctification, transformation and change. And they continued thinking, speaking and living like the world and therefore were not molded into his image. And so he didn't recognize his image in them and therefore he said, I don't know you. This was also described later on in the same chapter of Matthew chapter 7, after Jesus had just told this parable of the ten virgins. In Matthew 7 verse 21 to 23, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That is a very sobering statement. Here in the scripture, Jesus said that not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. What I have been showing you in this message and throughout this online conference is that it's about a lot more than just saying a salvation prayer to become born again. After that is an important journey of sanctification, transformation and change it comes through repentance and renewing our mind with the word of God so that we come back to the place of living according to the instructions of his word and live the Shema lifestyle that defines the bride. In these scriptures where Jesus says, I don't know you or I never knew you, it's the same word that is used in scripture when it says that a man knew a woman, which refers to sexual intimacy between a husband and wife. One of the main purposes that Abba Father instituted marriage was to give us a physical picture of the type of intimate love relationship that Jesus desires to have with us as our bridegroom spiritually. When a man is intimate with his wife, he deposits his seed into her, which grows to produce the fruit of children. When we become born again, spiritually, Abba Father deposits his seed on the inside of us, the seed of love and everything of who he is. And as we water that seed with his word, it grows to produce fruit which is the fruits of the Holy Spirit, where his character becomes a part of our character so that we walk in his image. This is where the bride becomes that golden menorah, which is also called a fruitful tree of life. This is the fullness of what it means 
to not only know Yeshua, Jesus our bridegroom, but to also be known by him. Our bridegroom Yeshua desires for us to spend time in intimacy with him in his presence. It's that time of deep, intimate fellowship in relationship with him, where we tabernacle with him in the most intimate place of the Holy of Holies. It's that personal, private time that we spend personally with him. The book of the Song of Solomon in the Bible is a description of sexual intimacy between a husband and wife. But in a deeper layer, it's about the intimate relationship between Yeshua and his bride. And in Song of Solomon 4 verse 11, it says, Your lips drip with nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. This is describing an open-mouthed, intimate kiss. But I want to share with you a deeper revelation in terms of how this relates to our relationship with Jesus spiritually. You may recall me sharing in previous sessions that the phrase milk and honey is a Hebrew idiom that refers to a person's inheritance. For example, if a person's parents left them a house or a farm or a business or something as their inheritance, that was referred to as that person's milk and honey. The promised land that God gave the Israelites was also referred to as a land of milk and honey because it was God's inheritance for his people. We learned in previous sessions that the promised land also symbolically represents our inheritance in Christ, which is the abundant life that he died to give us. But the Israelites didn't receive the whole of their promised land all at once. They progressively received their inheritance and one portion or piece of land at a time as they conquered each of the seven enemy nations. And in previous sessions, we learned that when you translate the Hebrew words for these seven enemy nations into English, it is the same spiritual strongholds of the enemy and kingdom of darkness that we have to learn to face and overcome today. Like the Hittites meaning fear, the Hivites meaning bitterness, the Canaanites meaning a low self-image and a low self-esteem, etc. And the way that we overcome these enemies is through repentance and renewing the mind. And in the process, one step at a time, we receive and walk into more and more of our promised land and inheritance in Christ as we experience more and more of the abundant life that he intended for us, such as peace, joy, love, and so on. Now, I mentioned all of that again, just to show you the connection between milk and honey, which is related to inheritance and repentance and renewing the mind. So here is the revelation of Song of Solomon 4 verse 11, where it says that under the bride's tongue is the bridegroom's milk and honey. When we spend time in intimacy with Jesus, and we allow him to work in our hearts, and we respond with repentance, and allow his word to cleanse and sanctify our hearts as we renew our minds, that for Jesus is like an intimate kiss, and that for him is his inheritance, where it describes milk and honey under the tongue of the bride. That is what Psalm 2 verse 12 means when it says, kiss the sun with a capital S. Time in intimacy with him, where we allow him to do a work of sanctification in our hearts. Isn't that beautiful? I pray that the Holy Spirit would give understanding of what I've just shared and that it would bless some who are listening. 
But what I would like to share some more about is how important fruitfulness is for the bride of Yahweh. Listen, what do you hear? The sound of false grace leading you into lawlessness. Listen, what do you hear? A covenant song leading you into fruitfulness. Heaven is my throne. The earth, my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? Where is the place of my rest? Is it not with the poor and contrite of heart who walk in my ways? I will put my Inside your mind, I will write it upon your heart. I shall come into you and create my garden within you, within you. There was a first Adam. There was a last Adam, you were cast out of the garden, but offered a way back. There was a first Eve, where is the last Eve? You were cast out in the darkness, misformed through the serpent seed, you are the last Eve. Generation of a restoration, the priestly bride return to the garden because of your high priest who made the way back for his last year. Oh, I will put my word inside. To set the stage for what I would like to share in this section, 
I would like to read pages 31 and 34 from a book called School of the Spirit by Sarah Van Furen from Bridal Harvest Ministries. This book is honestly the most spiritually rich book that I have ever come across in my life personally. And if there was one book that I could get into your hands, it would be this one. So I do encourage you to get a copy for yourself from the Bridal Harvest website shown in the title on the screen. The first page is titled, He is the gardener of my heart, therefore I am fruitful. Genesis 1 verse 28 says, And God blessed them, granting them certain authority, and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth, and subjugate it, putting it under your power, and rule over and dominate the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. When I created the garden in the beginning, I had your heart in mind. When I created the garden in Eden, I created it to be fruitful. And when I created you, I also created you to be fruitful in spirit, soul and body. I want you to discover my heart regarding fruitfulness because it is a part of your greatest core. I want to repeat that again. Fruitfulness is a part of your greatest core. You can only discover my heart regarding fruitfulness and you can only be truly fruitful if you walk with the gardener of gardeners. Many times my children are more interested in doing something for me because it makes them feel good about themselves and worthy, rather than being focused on producing true and pure fruit. Being truly fruitful is not about optics. A seed has to die before it can produce a harvest. You will have to die to certain areas of yourself and be willing to go through storms of suffering in order to become deeply rooted and firmly established in me. When you choose to be fruitful and walk with me as the gardener of your heart, you are always willing and eager to search your own heart instead of being outwardly focused on situations and people's reactions. When you pursue fruitfulness, you will walk on the path of maturity. You will be known by your fruit in eternity, you will not always be called by your name, but you will be called according to your choices. If I look at my people today, I see many whose names are lukewarm, double-minded, fleshly. Apart from me, you cannot truly bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. I have told you that it is my desire that my people will return to my garden through listening and obeying. I want to take you into the secret places of the garden. I want to take you deeper into my garden. However, this means that the seed of self will have to die in a much deeper way than before. There are not many who are willing to pay this price, and that is why my bride is only a remnant. I want to give you the key to my gardener heart. The key is called seeking me. Do you remember I shared this in the message on the key to change in session six, part two? I emphasized that without spending time with him in his presence, it will be impossible to see any real long-term change in our life and character and bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Unless you put a seed in the soil, it will never grow into a tree and bear fruit. In the same way, 
It's impossible for us to be fruitful without spending time in his presence, which is where the change happens. Carrying on reading where we were before. I want to give you the key to my gardener heart. The key is called seeking me. Too many of my children do not really know what it means to seek me. Have you asked me what I desire to do in the garden of your heart? Have you walked with me through our garden to examine it through my eyes? Have you been keeping your garden, tending it, allowing it to be purged and pruned? Is your garden filled with the flowers of worship or is it dry, dull and fruitless? It is not hopeless in my hands, but you will have to learn to seek me in order to know my heart for you personally. My people give up and become discouraged too easily. You need to learn perseverance and endurance in my presence while seeking me. The gardening of your heart is a process and so is seeking me. Learn to be consistent with spiritual principles. Empty yourself as you pursue my heart and remember that the walk with the gardener is not just about the destination, it's about the journey. It is not just about being fruitful, it's about knowing me. Sorry, I feel I also need to repeat that sentence as well. Remember that the walk with the gardener is not just about the destination, it's about the journey. It is not just about being fruitful, it's about knowing me. You see, just to talk for a moment, when we get to know him, the natural response to knowing him is to change. When we are struggling with walking in circles in the desert, on the Exodus journey away from Egypt and the ways of the serpent, the devil, which is sin, and the ways of the world, which is what Egypt spiritually represents. And we are struggling with laying down our soulish life of living for ourselves with the temporary pleasures of the flesh and worldliness and compromise and lukewarmness. It's because we don't know him. Because if we truly knew him and his love for us, we would go through this process of change. If we truly knew him and his love, we would lay down our soulish lives in a heartbeat. In order to be truly fruitful, as we go through this process of repentance and sanctification that leads us into fruitfulness, this progressive journey of each step of change has to start from the launching pad of time in his presence daily, where we get to know him in order to be properly and truly fruitful. Continuing with reading where we left off. When you truly know me, you will be fruitful without it having to be an effort. It will flow out of your innermost being as your first nature. The journey to fruitfulness and maturity is about your nature having to become my nature again. Success 
our acceptance And we end up being fading flowers Instead of fruitful trees Whose leaves do not wither Whose fruit do not fade Whose fruit do not fade in your fruit that comes from your heart that is something only I can cultivate I am a fruit farmer my heart's not just a harvest my heart is present in the process glory is and beautiful to me an open, broken pomegranate, the glory of the colors on the outside is not its beauty, is not its beauty, but when you break it open, it's the substance on the inside that overcomes and surpasses its outward colors Do not fear brokenness or being different Cause it brings beauty, beauty that was made for me Your beauty lies in me, your beauty lies in your fruit comes from your heart that is something only I can cultivate I am a fruit farmer my heart's not just a harvest my heart is present in the process I do not just expect a produce Look after my garden, I keep it, I tend it Cause I am the creator, it belongs to me I will not leave it only in a place of potential Your beauty lies in me, your beauty lies in your fruit comes from your heart that is something only I can cultivate I am a fruit farmer my heart's not just a harvest my heart is present in the process your beauty lies in me your beauty lies in your fruit that comes from your heart that is something only I can cultivate I am a fruit farmer My heart's not just a harvest My heart is present In the process My heart is present In the process I will cultivate what I can and will in the soil of broken yet beautiful love I will cultivate what I can and will in the soil of broken yet beautiful The next page that I need to read from the School of the Spirit book is called Becoming the Blossoming Lampstand. Exodus 37 verse 17 to 23 
describes God's instructions for making the menorah of the tabernacle as one piece of hammered work made of pure gold. Remember that gold in scripture is symbolic of putting God's word inside of our hearts in that time that we invest renewing our mind with the word of God so that it transforms us into the image of God. And the golden menorah is symbolic of us as the bride whom he has called to be transformed back into his image so that our lives become a light where we reflect his image and demonstrate who he is to those around us in the way that we think, speak, live our daily lives and respond to people and situations that we walk through. So to begin reading, when the menorah within the tabernacle was made of pure gold, I thought of you. You were always called to be the greater blossoming lampstand within the tabernacle of my heart. Did you know that the menorah is nothing other than a fruitful tree? The fruit of the menorah is called light. This is why I have brought you to the menorah today. I want you to become the blossoming tree of light. You can only be fruitful if you live your life entirely in my light. Today you need to carry the light of the menorah tree into the areas of your life that are unfruitful. When barren and unfruitful branches encounter my oil that brings light, they are healed and come to life. Now that you have brought the unfruitful branches of your life to me, I want to anoint them with oil and with light. Come with me as I continue to teach your spirit man to walk with me spirit to spirit. Go past the altar of burnt offerings and the bronze lava wash basin and enter the inner court, which is the dimension of your soul. Walk to the menorah and sit with me under the branches of its light. To stop reading there for a moment, just to remind you what this is talking about. Remember that previously I explained that the tabernacle is a blueprint for how God designed and created us, where the outer court of the tabernacle corresponds to the body. The inner court of the tabernacle corresponds with our soul and the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle corresponds with our spirit. Looking at the tabernacle from the outside, in the outer court is the altar where animal sacrifices were done in the Old Testament. Jesus' blood shed on the cross was the ultimate sacrifice and for us, this represents applying his blood to our lives through repentance as we progressively deal with and repent for each of the areas of our lives that is not in line with his word and is not right with him and which comes from the kingdom of darkness and the serpent. Then in the outer court, you also have the wash basin, which is symbolic for us of the washing of the water of the word through renewing the mind. So now you can see how everything we have been learning about comes together. Because like the seven biblical feasts, the tabernacle and the seven items of furniture in it, in terms of the spiritual principles these things represent, leads us on this journey of sanctification as it teaches us how to walk in his kingdom ways and it leads us through this journey to becoming his bride as it leads us to knowing him in this beautiful, deep, intimate love relationship with him. So in the outer court, there is the altar 
and the wash basin. Then from the outer court, you go into the inside of the tabernacle to the inner court. Between the inner court of the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies is the veil. And then you go into the Holy of Holies. In the inner court is where the menorah is, which is what we are talking about now. So coming back to the page I was reading from the School of the Spirit book. Go past the altar of burnt offerings and the bronze lava wash basin and enter the inner court, which is the dimension of your soul. Walk to the menorah and sit with me under the branches of its light. Allow my oil to drip on you as you once again lift up the desolate, dry areas of your life in submission, yielding them to me. Ask my light to enter the situations of your life that are uncertain, unfulfilled, unfruitful, and even hopeless. You need my light because the enemy of your garden likes to hide. If you do not have my light, you will not be able to see why. You are not walking in, in my fullness and why you have found yourself in a desert for so long. I will cause your desert to rejoice and blossom as a rose. It will blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy so that you will see my glory. I will show you the way to overcome unfruitfulness. Seek me for it. Maybe it has never bothered you that you are unfruitful because you've never realized that you aren't living in my fullness. Ask me to give you a glimpse of my fullness so that you might understand that you've missed out on a lot of what I've purchased for you. It's time to go deeper. <laughs> the free. 
fruit Let the blossoms appear Let the fruit start to form Will you either give light Or be left in the dark? Awaken, awaken My worshipping bright Let the blossoms come forth Let the fruit start to form Awaken Session 7, Part 2, I gave an introduction to the tabernacle, and I mentioned how God is a very detailed God. Nothing in the Bible is mentioned by accident. There is a lot of meaning and significance to every little detail. For example, God was very specific and detailed when he told Noah how to build the ark. And he was very specific and detailed when he told Moses how to build the tabernacle. Exactly how long, wide and high each part of the tabernacle must be. Exactly what color and type of material each part must be made from and so on. Now the Hebrew language, as I've mentioned many times, is written in letters like our language is written in letters such as A, B, C, D, etc. And each of the Hebrew letters is also represented by numbers as well as pictures. When you study the detail of the tabernacle, such as the numbers of the length, width and height of each part of the tabernacle, and you convert them to the letters that they represent and the pictures they represent, and you study the material of what each part of the tabernacle is made up of and what it represents, do you know that it tells the whole story of Jesus and what he would accomplish for us when he died on the cross? Everything that is said in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was already encoded in the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 25. And as I just explained, the tabernacle consists of seven items of furniture, which is interconnected with the seven biblical feasts and all the other patterns of seven that I mentioned in session 10, part one. The tabernacle leads us on a journey spiritually, which is the same journey that is represented by the spiritual principles encoded into the seven biblical feasts and all the other patterns of seven in scripture. It is a journey of repentance and sanctification that leads us to being transformed into his image 
so that we can be fruitful and experience the fullness of the abundant life that he died to give us. And as I said, it is a journey to becoming his bride as we walk into a deeper covenant love relationship with him. It is a journey that tells the story of this beautiful divine romance between the bridegroom, Yeshua the Messiah, and his bride. And when you've journeyed through each part of the tabernacle and applied the spiritual principles that each part represents to your life, when you get to the most intimate place of the Holy of Holies, do you know what the conclusion of this whole story is? It is a prayer that the bride offers up where she says, Abba Father, make me desirable to my bridegroom. Song of Solomon 6 verse 3 says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And in verse 10 it says, I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. What makes us the bride of his desire? What makes us desirable to our bridegroom? Do you really want to know the answer? The fruits of the Holy Spirit that are cultivated in our heart and character that transforms us into his image is what makes us beautiful and desirable to Jesus, Yeshua, our bridegroom and king. Earlier in this message, Lisa sang that song called Cultivated Beauty, where the words say, your beauty lies in me, your beauty lies in your fruit. In this message, I'm going to show you how the book of Ezekiel and many other scriptures explain this, where it talks about the bridegroom adorning his bride with gold and silver and all sorts of beautiful jewelry. The meaning of this spiritually is us being adorned in the spirit with the beauty of the fruits of the spirit. To understand what takes place spiritually, you can compare this to the beautifying of a bride for her bridegroom in the natural. For example, when you walk in the fruit of the spirit of love, imagine a beautiful crown being placed on your head in the spiritual realm. When you cultivate the fruits of peace and joy in your heart and life, imagine beautiful jewels being added to that crown. When you cultivate the fruits of patience and self-control, imagine a beautiful necklace being put around your neck in the spiritual realm. And when you walk in the fruits of the Holy Spirit of kindness, faithfulness and gentleness, and you choose to walk in things like forgiveness and mercy and so on, imagine being adorned in the spirit with earrings and all sorts of beautiful jewelry that makes us incredibly spiritually beautiful and desirable to Yeshua, our bridegroom. Now the bride of Christ consists of both men and women, and I understand that it's a bit difficult for the men to imagine the analogy that I've just put across, but bear with me for the sake of explaining the deeper spiritual meaning as it relates to Jesus, our bridegroom, beautifying us as his bride with the fruits of the Holy Spirit spiritually. In this light, I would like to read page 18 of the Shema book, also written by Sarah from Bridal Harvest Ministries. Song of Solomon 1 verse 10 to 11 says, Your cheeks are comely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make for you chains and ornaments of gold studded with silver. How I long to beautify my bride with my jewels, with my gold and silver. 
I long to beautify my bride with my character. Character that is kind and sweet and lovely. I want people to look at my bride and see that she is rich in my character and her character displays that she is royalty. Revelation 3 verse 17 to 19 says, For you say I am rich, I have prospered and grown wealthy, and I am in need of nothing. And you do not realize and understand that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore I counsel you to purchase from me gold refined and tested by fire, that you may be truly wealthy and have white clothes to clothe you, to keep the shame of your nudity from being seen, and salve to put on your eyes that you may see. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults, and convict and convince and reprove and chasten. I discipline and instruct them. So be enthusiastic and in earnest and burning with zeal and repent, changing your mind and attitude. My beloved, I long to refine you. I want to burn and beautify you with my jealousy, because as I do, you are purified from all the soulish and sinful clutter within you, and you become pure like gold. I want to try you like silver is tried, refined and purified. I sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and I will purify my bride and refine her like gold and silver that she may offer to me an offering in righteousness. I am a holy fire, and I want to burn away all the impurities within you, so that you may stand completely purified in my presence. In my kingdom you receive, but you also buy. My love, grace, and salvation you receive freely, but refined character has to be bought. It comes at a price. You buy refined character in the fire of my jealousy. And by the way, his jealousy means that he doesn't want to share us with the kingdom of darkness. So his fire removes everything from the kingdom of darkness. If you do not allow my refining fire in your life, you will always be lukewarm because it is my fire that keeps your heart in a first love status. It is only my fire that keeps you mine. This gold is the purity of a first love heart that is so zealous for me that you become the mirror image of who I am. Therefore, if you do not allow my fire, you will not be likened as my bride because her I love, and therefore I chasten her, and I convict her, so that she may display the beauty of who I am. I want you to ask me daily, to take you through the fire, and even to turn up the heat seven times, because you want to be bejeweled by my character. You want to be in my likeness. My fire is not a comfortable place, it will burn you. But I do not want you to be in a place of comfort where you conform to passivity. I am more interested in your character than your comfort. I am more interested in making your life holy through my fire than in making your life happy. There are not many people who are willing to live a life of constantly allowing my fire. There is only a remnant, my bride. And that is why she is called a pure bride, because she buys gold and the price she pays for it is herself. In other words, it's talking about dying to self. Because I loved her first. She is not her own, for she was bought at a price. 
And that price I paid myself. Sarah, who wrote this, once shared with me personally about an experience she had where Yeshua allowed her to see the wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb that Scripture speaks about. And she shared how what we will feast on at the wedding feast is the fruit of our lives. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And she explained that when you bite into the fruit, the juice that flows out of it is so abundant that it overflows out of the corners of your mouth and runs down your neck. And when you taste it, the emotions and everything that that fruit of the Holy Spirit is, such as love or peace or joy, for example, surges through your whole spirit, soul and body. And I shared that just to give us a brief glimpse of how amazing it's going to be to be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in these times, we need to live for the kingdom that is to come and not for now. And being a fruitful bride is incredibly important. But the thing about fruit is that it has to be tested in the fire. Beauty comes from the refiner's fire. Proverbs 17 verse 3, for example, says, The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Job 23 verse 10 says, And when he tests me, I will come out as pure as gold. The fruits of the Holy Spirit is the character of Yahweh that he desires to become a part of our character so that we are transformed into his image. But gold is made through being refined in the fire. And do you know how the refiner knows when the gold is fully purified and is ready? When it gets to the point when he takes it out the fire and looks into it, that he can see the reflection of his face. Gold is made in the refiner's fire through a process where the heat is progressively turned up and the impurities are skimmed off as they rise to the surface until the refiner can see his face reflected in the surface of the pure precious metal. In the same way, Abba Father needs to allow his bride to go through the fire. For example, the difficult times that are increasing in the world around us as we move into the end times, where Jesus described these end time events like birth pangs that progressively increase in intensity, like the refiner's fire gets progressively turned up to purify his bride until he can see his face, his image reflected through her. Remember, this is what the priestly blessing in number six, verse 23 to 27 says. It says, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. His face shining upon us is where we are like gold that reflects the face of the refiner, the face of Yahweh, as we walk in and reflect his image. Remember that this is what the golden menorah in the tabernacle symbolizing the bride represents. a silence in the separation between the desert and the presence
promised ground. I am busy bringing you closer, creating character in the quietness. I wanna see your face in my face. I wanna breathe your breath as I. See the way you see. I wanna hear your voice as you whisper. Paint your picture, use your hands, form my flesh into your design. Take my pain, every piece of pride, every strand. Paint your picture, use your hands Fold my flesh into your design Take my pain, every piece of pride Every strand of fear inside Don't get impatient, my child It takes time To transform your heart into mine It takes time to refine I wanna see your face in my face I wanna breathe your breath as I look Paint your picture, use your hands Form my flesh into your design Take my pain, every piece of pride Every strand of fear inside Paint your picture, use your hands Form my flesh into your design your hands for my flesh into your design take my pain every piece of pride every strand of fear inside paint your picture use your hands for my flesh into your design take my pain every piece of pride every strand of fear inside In session 10, part 1, I encouraged you to realize that there is a purpose that Abba Father has for his bride in the fire of the end times. And that is to remove the impurities of worldliness, fleshliness, and compromise, and to transform us from the place of being lukewarm to where our heart is hot on fire with love for him and it leads us to the place of being ready for his return when he comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the lamb because that is Abba Father's plan 
in the end times that he revealed to us through the prophetic significance and meaning of the biblical feasts. His plan is to prepare his bride to be ready for when he comes to fetch her at the rapture. And the enemy's plan for the end times will be defeated as the Messiah returns with heaven's armies and his worshipping warrior bride to remove the enemy and Satan and sin from this earth. This is Abba Father's plan and purpose in it all. So in the end, Jesus wins. Professor Gary Bester gave an excellent teaching on the Feast of Trumpets this year in 2021, which is freely available on YouTube and which I encourage you to go and watch because it will greatly edify you, encourage you, and strengthen you in your inner man as we face the fire in the time ahead as the world catapults into the end times. There he shared how Abba Father's message in this time for his people is to trust Abba Father's plan in the process. He unpacked the deeper Hebrew meaning of the word trust when scripture says that we must trust Abba Father, which means we are able to face the difficult circumstances of these times without any fear, with a fearless faith that comes from a place of total security in Abba Father's love. And the picture of that security in the Hebrew word for trust is that of a baby being tightly swaddled in a blanket. In other words, the security we feel of Abba Father's love swaddling us like a tightly wrapped blanket enables us to face the world and the fire of the end times with a fearless faith as we trust his plan and his purpose in the process. When I was studying the deeper meaning of everything in the tabernacle, when you look at the measurements, colors, material, and every detail of the tabernacle, and translate it into the Hebrew pictures and words it represents, it comes up over and over and over the picture that Abba Father has us in the palm of his hand. And I eventually wondered why this message is repeated so many times in the story of the tabernacle. But in these very severe, difficult circumstances that the world is moving into as a part of the end times, that is something that we really need to know because the tabernacle more than anything is for the end time bride. Abba Father, has got us in the palm of his hand, and he is ultimately in control of everything. And that is why we need to trust him and trust his plan and his purpose as we walk with him through the fire. Imagine being in the disciples' shoes when Jesus was crucified. They had walked with Jesus for years laid down their whole lives, left behind their jobs, livelihoods and families, and had hung on his every word. And they had built their dreams of their future of changing the world around all the exciting things of the kingdom that Jesus had shared with them. But all of a sudden, those dreams seemed to be shattered, and none of those words seemed to make sense anymore as Jesus hung, whipped, beaten, and dying on the cross. And at that moment, as they stood at the foot of the cross, all they could see and feel was fear and hopelessness, as the future looked black and filled with uncertainty. In their minds, they must have been thinking, this is the worst imaginable case scenario. How could God allow this to happen? 
How could any good come out of this? And at that time, the enemy and principalities and powers of darkness were celebrating because they thought that they had won and had the victory. But we look back now, 2000 years later, at the same situation and see the cross as the most beautiful thing in the world. Because we understand God's plan of redemption for our salvation in the whole process. And in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8, it talks about how horrified Satan and his kingdom were when they realized that actually they had been defeated. And it says that had Satan understood God's plan in the process, he would have never crucified Jesus. The enemy had a plan, but ultimately God was in control and the enemy's plan was defeated as God's plan was fulfilled. In exactly the same way, the enemy has a plan in these end times, but ultimately God is in control. He is holding us tightly in the palm of his hand, and we need to trust God's plan in the process of allowing us to go through the fire of the end times before he comes to fetch us, and we can face these circumstances without fear, because we are secure in his love that is like a blanket that is tightly wrapped around us, like a blanket swaddles a newborn baby. And as we walk through the fire that gets hotter and hotter, as we move into the realities of the end times, understanding that Abba Father has a purpose for this process, we can cooperate with him to allow his Holy Spirit to refine us like gold is refined in the fire so that we can be molded into the image of Yahweh and become a fruitful bride that is ready for his return. The book of Daniel in the Bible has many prophecies about the end times and the story of Daniel is a foreshadow of the end times with many important spiritual parallels to show the bride how to walk through the fire of the end times. In the time of Daniel, the world was under the control and grip of Babylon, which is rooted in the ways of Egypt that come from the same ancient enemy who is Satan. And we will see history repeat itself in the same way in the end times as the world again comes under the control of Babylon. In Daniel chapter 3, Daniel's three friends Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were dealing with a severely testing and potentially terrifying situation. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had made an idol that everybody in the world at that time was commanded to bow down to, otherwise they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. Daniel's three friends refused to compromise and thus were brought before the king where they were threatened that they must do what he says or they will die. And they replied, well, actually, no, we don't have to listen to you. And the king said, oh, yes, you do. Either you obey what I command you to do, or you will be burnt alive. And they said, well, actually, you don't have a choice in the matter, because our life and destiny, and whether we live or die, is in God's hands, not yours. And whatever God decides is okay with us. All that we know is that we are in covenant with him, and not with you, and his covenant trumps the situation. So you do whatever you need to do, but whatever happens to us, we will have peace, and we will not fear, and we will trust our God, even if he doesn't save us in the fire. But one of the key messages for the end-time bride that Abba Father has for us here 
is that he will never leave us or forsake us in the fire, as he promised in Hebrews 13, verse 5 to 6. He will be with us in the fire when we choose to trust him with uncompromising obedience. Daniel 3, verse 24 to 27, gives an account of what happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king saw and was astounded. He jumped up and said to his counsellors, Did we not cast three men bound and tied up in the midst of the fire? And they answered, True, O king. And he answered, Behold, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like a son of the gods. That was Jesus with them in the fire, just like he will be with his bride in the fire of the end times. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning furnace and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, Come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, the deputies, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered around together and saw these men, that the fire had no power upon their bodies, nor was the hair on their head singed, neither was their garment scorched or changed in color or condition, nor had they even the smell of smoke that had clung to them. The Bible teaches us to submit to godly authority. But when those in whatever form of leadership go against the word of God and try to enforce things that are rooted in the ways of Babylon and Egypt, which is against the word of God, we need to submit to the higher authority which is the word of God. Think of the reality that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego faced when they stood before the literal heat of the fire of the furnace. How terrifying that must have been. And they had to make a choice, either compromise and bow to the idols of Babylon in fear for their life or give up their life and be thrown into the fire. In the end times, the bride will face a similar choice, where through fear for our life, the enemy will try to make us bow and submit to the ways of Babylon and Egypt. Revelations 13 verse 17 says, and that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. What is happening in the world right now is a dress rehearsal for Revelations 13 verse 17. For example, the temperature checks where people's heads or hands are scanned before entering any shops, businesses and public transport, etc. is simply a mental programming exercise to get people used to their heads and hands being scanned for the mark in a time that is very close to becoming a worldwide reality. Now when you go to the shops it says no mask, no service. That is a precursor for no mark, no service. What are you going to do when you are faced with the same situation as Daniel's friends. Will you choose to bow to Babylon in the ways of Egypt? Or will you choose to trust Abba Father in the fire and have the same attitude as Daniel's friends where they said, even if God doesn't save us, we will not bow to the idols and ways of Babylon and we will not compromise. We will trust God even in the midst of the fire. The pharmaceutical deceptions 
that people are being pressured to receive today is programming people in spirit, soul, and body to be ready to receive the mark when it comes. Even now, many people are facing the threat of losing their jobs unless they bow to pharmacy and sorcery and the ways of Egypt. But like Daniel, Daniel and his friends, whatever happens, we can trust God in the face of the fire, even when all normal worldly streams of income are cut off and other consequences come, such as not being able to travel and eventually not even being able to go to the shops to buy food. I've heard some people saying, I had no choice because otherwise I will lose my job. No, no matter how difficult circumstances get, please remember we are never in a place where we have no choice but to compromise. We will always have a choice. The other choice is not to compromise and to choose to trust Abba Father. Because as we refuse to bow, we know that we are in the palm of Abba Father's hand. And like in the story of Daniel, God will be with us in the fire. And so we can trust him and trust his plan in the process as he allows us to go through the fire and we can come through it refined like gold as a golden menorah, which is a fruitful tree of life. I'm good. 
through the fire of these end times, we must remember that our Father has a very important purpose for the fire, as it is a vital process to preparing us to be ready when Jesus comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The fire of the hardships of the end times presents to us as his bride a golden opportunity, no pun intended, to embrace it as the refiner's fire to mould us as his bride into a golden menorah, which is a fruitful tree of life that bears abundant fruit. In other words, the refiner's fire is a golden opportunity for us to cultivate the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is his character in our character, so that we can be transformed into his image. And when we understand this, we are able to have courage and to face the end times with fearless faith, as we choose to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to do the work in us that Abba Father needs to do through the process of the fire. The fruit of the Holy Spirit can only really be cultivated under the pressure of difficult circumstances. Abba Father's intention for his bride, as she walks through the difficulties of the fire of the end times, is for her to grow in beauty through it, like a fruitful garden of Eden blossoming in the middle of the desert. In Song of Solomon, Jesus described his bride as a rock rose and a lily among the thorns, which means that we grow and blossom in beauty through the difficult circumstances the same way that a rock rose grows in deep and difficult places. Song of Solomon 2 verse 1 to 2 says, She said, I am only a little rose or autumn crocus of the plain of Sharon, or a humble lily of the valleys that grows in deep and difficult places. But Solomon replied, Like the lily among the thorns, so are you, my love, among the daughters. My bride is like a rock rose, a garden in the desert. She prospers no matter what the natural circumstances are, because I am her source, her life supply. The elements do not discourage her as she is deeply rooted in me. My bride will walk through the valley and the wilderness. She will go through difficulties and face the thorns of others' rejection. But those thorns of rejection will become a crown upon her head because she is dead in my death and alive in my resurrection. Therefore she is not moved, she is not hurt because she prospers through it and bears the fruit of beauty. Yes, my beloved is a lily among the thorns. Even though she goes through the valley of the shadow of death, she abides in me 
and she finds comfort and rest in the shade of my presence where she is restored and where she grows to even greater beauty. My bride is faced with many tests in the furnace of affliction. She is taken deep into the valley because I want her to prosper humbly like a lily. The beauty of my bride is she is able to prosper among tribulations and difficulties. As she draws even closer to me, I become her rock and her shelter, her safe place of refuge. Do not become weary and oppressed when you are down in the valley of difficulty and struggles. I put you there to test you so that you can grow in the shade of my protection where I can watch over you. When my people are in a comfort zone, they stop growing and they end up building idols out of pride. I am continually drawing my bride into the valley because I want her to grow. I want her to prosper and bear much fruit. I want her roots to go deeper and deeper in me. You are humbled in this place because you know that I am your only way through. A time will come where we will skip upon the hills and leap over the mountains. When you look to your sides in the place of the valley, all you see is your circumstances that put you in a gorge and you do not know a way out. But look up and see me standing on the mountain top. I will lead you through the darkness of the valley where you will be humbled, but you will stand next to me on the mountain top and taste the fruit of promise. I will always take you through. Even when you feel alone or forsaken down in the valley, keep heart and know that I will lead you through. I need to take my bride into the low places of the valley so that she can search her own heart and strip away all the leaves of self that shuts up her beauty. John 12 verse 24 to 25 Truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who loses his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. Allow me to take you through the valley where you will die to self and where you will have to lay down yourself so that my purposes can be fulfilled. Allow me to change the thorns in your life into lilies that glorify me. That was page 20 of the Shema book, which is titled, Like a Lily. I shared all of this because the purpose of this message is to explain what it means to be ready when Jesus returns. And I am in the process of showing that when Jesus comes back, scripture says that he wants to find a fruitful bride. We have seen how the seven biblical feasts established by God in scripture are prophetically symbolic of Jesus' first and second coming. In his first coming, he died on the cross and offered us salvation. In his second coming, he will fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We also see the purpose of Jesus' first and second coming depicted in a parable in Ezekiel chapter 16. Here we see God choosing Israel as his bride. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed, rubbed with salt or swaddled with bands at all. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you to have compassion on you, but you were cast out in the open field, for your person was abhorrent and loathsome on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you, 
and saw you rolling about in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you still in your natal blood, live. The first time that Jesus passed by his bride-to-be, he found her as a baby, cast out and rejected, lost and dying in a cruel, harsh world. Through his sacrificial death on the cross at his first coming, he proclaimed to her, live. Here he provided salvation for all mankind. Then carrying on with Ezekiel chapter 6 verse 7. I caused you Israel to multiply as the bud which grows in the field, and you increased and became tall, and you came to full maidenhood and beauty. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. Now I passed you by again and looked upon you, and behold, you were maturing at a time for love. In other translations, it says here, Behold, you were ready for love and a lover. And I spread my wings over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I became betrothed to you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord and you became mine. Then I washed you with water. Yes, I thoroughly washed away your clinging blood from you, and I anointed you with oil. I clothed you with embroidered cloth, and shod you with fine seal leather, and girded you about with fine linen, and covered you with silk. In session eight, part six of the online conference, I went into detail about the medical and spiritual significance of linen to the Bride of Christ, who is described as wearing white linen wedding garments here in Ezekiel, in the book of Revelations, and in many other places throughout Scripture. But to carry on reading, I decked you also with ornaments, and I put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring in your nostril and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown upon your head. Thus you were decked with gold and silver. What we are reading here, as we see the bridegroom putting all of this jewelry on his bride, is the description of the bride being adorned with the jewels of his character, such as the fruits of the Holy Spirit that he is beautifying her with, as she is being washed in the water of his word, which you know by now means renewing her mind with the word of God. Continuing with the scripture, and your raiment was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. And there we see the bride dressed in linen again. You ate fine flour and honey and oil, and you were exceedingly beautiful and you prospered into royal estate. So at this stage in her spiritual journey, the bride has come to know him and now is becoming like him and she has grown into that golden menorah, which is a fruitful tree of life. Carrying on with the scripture, and your renown went forth among the nations for your beauty. So now she's at the point of not just knowing him and becoming like him, but she's making him known as the light of her life reflects who he is as she walks in his image, which is what that golden menorah is symbolic of. For it was perfect through my majesty and splendor, which I had put upon you, says the Lord God. When Jesus comes a second time, he's going to pass by his bride again to see if she has matured and is ready for love. In the natural, when a baby is born, it's not ready emotionally or physically for marriage. It has to mature in order to be ready for love and a lover. In the same way, when we are born again at the time of salvation, we are like babies spiritually, 
and are not yet ready for our bridegroom. So between the time of salvation, represented by the feasts at the beginning of the year, and him fetching us as his bride, which is represented by the feast at the end of the year, there is a spiritual maturation process that needs to take place called sanctification of our spirit, soul, and body, as we learned in session six, part one of this online conference. This is where he desires us to renew our minds with his word. Again, that is the washing of the water of his word that was alluded to in Ezekiel 16, verse 9. And for it to bear fruit in our lives, adorning ourselves with the jewels of his character, which is the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is what makes us beautiful and desirable to him. This is what transforms us into the bride of his desire. This is what all the symbolism of the gold, silver and jewelry described in Ezekiel chapter 16 between verses 10 and 14 represents. Song of Solomon 6 verse 10 to 11 says, Who is this that grows like the dawn? as beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun, and as awesome as an army with banners. Isn't Jesus, Yeshua, our bridegroom, romantic in the way that he speaks to us? In verse 11, it goes on to say, I went down to the orchard of nut trees to see the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded or the pomegranates had bloomed. In session 10, part 1, I shared that in scripture, pomegranates, which is the only fruit with a crown, is symbolic of the bride. In this verse in Song of Solomon, the king going down to his garden is a parable alluding to our bridegroom and king coming down from heaven to earth at his second coming. Here the king goes down to his garden to see if the fruit has reached maturity. You see, Jesus is not returning for an immature girl as his bride. Even in the natural, romantic love is not appropriate for children. For a girl to be ready for love and intimacy, her body must mature. For example, her breasts must develop and her hips must widen. In the same way, the body of Christ needs to mature spiritually in order to be ready as his bride. He wants to find a bride that is matured and is bearing fruit in her life spiritually. In other words, to see if we've matured, by developing the fruits of the Spirit and the qualities of His character in our character and lifestyle, and to see if we have been molded and transformed into His image. He wants to find our hearts and lifestyle in a condition where we have cultivated the fruits of the Spirit like a fruitful garden of Eden. Ladies and gentlemen, Let's get ready for a bridal harvest.
Your face is sweet. Oh. 